got put it in the last slot because by this time, at least my brain is kind of full and having a sort of hardcore technical talk, you know, just doesn't seem quite right in this time slot. But that's what you've got, so enjoy, I guess. Um, this is not a talk about how you set up or use ZFS. There's tons and tons and tons of talks and blogs and everything else about that. What I actually wanted to know was, like, how does it actually work, like, under the hood? And uh, it's a little daunting when you first want to dive into the code, because there's about a quarter million lines of code in making up ZFS. Uh, and uh, even for me, that, that's kind of daunting to try and dive into. Um, luckily, uh, I had the ac access to Matt Aarons, and all I had to do was take him out to lunch, and uh, he would just draw it all on the back of a napkin, and then I just wrote it up, and it became chapter 10 of the book. Uh, so, in fact, uh, these slides are drawn straight out of that chapter, so if you want to just, like, skip to the chase, you can just go read chapter 10, and you can probably do it faster than standing here and listening to me drone on for an hour about it. Uh, at any rate, um, what I want to do is to try and just sort of give you an overview. I don't really have time, believe it or not, to do all of ZFS. Um, so I'm just going to try and hit some of the highlights. Um, many of you are on the BSD conference circuit, so you probably heard this at one of the earlier conferences that I gave it at. Uh, but even for you, I've mixed it up. I threw out some of the slides that were there before and added some new ones this time. So. Uh, you can play the game of guess what are the new slides in Kirk's presentation. All right. Oh, come on. <laughs> My battery died. How can that be? <laughs> All right. So let's start with an overview. Uh, the ZFS is in the class of file systems that we call the, the non-overwriting file system, or copy-on-write file system, if you prefer. The idea is once a block gets written on the disk, we never overwrite it again. Uh, if, if the contents of that thing needs to change, then we are going to make a new copy of it. So in the traditional UFS style overwriting file system, if you change the mode of a file, we read the inode in, we change the, the little mode bits in there, and then we write it back on top of the same place on the disk. Whereas in ZFS, we bring it in, we make the change, and now it's going to be written into a new block. And uh, eventually when we take a checkpoint, that will become part of the, the state of the file system. And so there's the old copy of the inode, and there's the new copy of the inode. And absent any snapshots, then that old copy uh, can simply be freed up, the block of disk that it's in. Uh, if there's a snapshot that still references it, of course, then we can't free it up because the snapshot is still using it. So a lot of the, the real trickiness of ZFS is keeping track of when it's time to free blocks. And I'll talk about that uh, towards the end of this talk. Another aspect of ZFS and non-overwriting file systems in general uh, uh, is the fact that the file system is always consistent. It, with UFS, there's this period of time where you know, some stuff's been updated and other stuff hasn't, and we stage things so that we can always recover the file system, but you still need to you know, run a log or run FSEK or whatever it is to get it back to a completely consistent state. Whereas with the non-overrating style of file system, changes happen in memory. And then at some point, we decide to take a checkpoint. We write all the new stuff out somewhere. And then the very last step is we update the uber block, the sort of the super block of the whole ZFS pool. And it's just that right that where we finally write the, the very root of the tree that then takes us from the previous to the new position. But that new position is consistent. So uh, either we've, we haven't written it yet, in which case we have the old consistent file system, or we have written it and we now have the new consistent file system. Uh, now, obviously, things can happen in between there. And uh, so, as you'll see, we have to carry along a log to make sure that we can update that consistent snapshot with the things that have changed since the last checkpoint that we took. OK, but the state always moves along atomically at e each time we take a checkpoint. So we never have to worry about, God forbid, running something like FSCK over the file system, because it just 
always consistent. Uh, and of course, then you say, oh yeah, but if a disk fails or this or that. So I mean, there's obviously has to be other levels of redundancy like RAID and other things um, to make sure that we can recover that state. Okay, snapshots, uh, which are read-only, or clones, which are read-write, are very cheap and plentiful. Um, there's effectively no limit to them based unless you, know, you run out of disk space or other minor details like that. But uh, unlike an overwriting file system, it's really easy to do it. You just take a checkpoint, and then you just sort of save a copy, if you will, of that Uber block effectively, or you know, actually it's a lower in the tree, but, uh, and you just, you know, that's, that's your snapshot. And since nothing is ever being overwritten, as long as you don't free any blocks, it's just going to be there. Uh, and so the cost of taking a snapshot isn't much more than you know, making, sort of a, making note of the fact that you have the snapshot uh, and then taking a checkpoint and boom, you have it. Uh, by comparison with an overwriting file system like UFS, because we're overwriting things, every time we go to write something, you have to go, oh my, are we changing something that's part of a snapshot? Do we need to make a copy of it? Blah, 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 blah. And so the more snapshots you have, the more of that checking that has to happen every time you write a block. Now there's little tricks that we have, so we don't really have to check it all that much and, and caches and things. But nevertheless, it's, it's painful and it's work. And the more snapshots you have, the slower it goes. And for that reason, we administratively limit you to 20 snapshots. Because when you get more than 20 snapshots, the overhead becomes too painful. Uh, and we did snapshots in UFS because we sort of needed them for doing background FSK, and you know, we needed them for sort of some sort of system administrative stuff. But they, they were, they've always been a, a, a sore spot. Uh, and so once ZFS came along, it was just like, great. They just do snapshots really well. If that's what you really need in your environment, you should be running ZFS. Uh, you know, people say, well, now that we have ZFS, is this just going to completely replace UFS? Uh, the answer is no, probably not. ZFS works really well, on, especially on giant uh, pools of data where you have a 64-bit processor and lots of memory and lots of processing power. Uh, you're not really going to see it on running much on your BeagleBone. You know, that, that's you, it's a small embedded sort of system. You probably want a much lighter weight uh, file system. Uh, UFS has far fewer features than ZFS has. If you need that feature set of ZFS, then you should be running ZFS. Uh, if you just have a small embedded system, probably UFS is what you want. All right. Uh, other things that ZFS has to help give it better reliability is the uh, metadata redundancy and data checksums. Uh, so in the case of UFS, if one of your indirect blocks gets trashed and you're not running with RAID or something so that you could reconstruct it, then you just lose that part of that file. Uh, with ZFS, you have, of course, RAID in the background typically to help you, but all of the metadata is duplicated. Every inode is duplicated. Every indirect block is duplicated. Every, anything that's metadata having to do with the file system has two copies, a minimum of two copies. And if you're particularly paranoid, you can say, well, I actually want redundancy of the data itself. And so it'll make two copies of all your data blocks, and for good measure, three copies of all your metadata in that instance. Uh, and when, when I talk about the, the block pointers, you'll see how that actually ends up being implemented. Uh, the other thing is that you have checksums on all your data blocks. And those checksums are not stored in the data block itself. Uh, and this actually helps, is it it's, gives you better protection than if the checksum is stored actually with the data block itself. And the place where this really helps is where you get what I'll call the, the uh, stray writes. Uh, you, you probably know on the, on the back planes when you know, data gets sent out across to some I.O. device, uh, there's a, a parity bit on the data lines so that if a data line bounces, then the parity bit will protect you. It'll let you know that it, you know, the data came through badly so they can get resent. Uh, for a long time, and in some buses still, there's no parity on the address lines. So if a bit flips in the address line, who knew? Uh, you don't have, you know, the, the sender thinks it 
send it to one place, the receiver says, okay, that's where they want it, and bam, it just goes to some random block on the disk. So not only does your data not get written where you do want it, you overwrite something else that you probably didn't want to overwrite. And so if the checksum were stored in the data block itself, then when you read that block back and check, did the checksum, you'd think it might be okay. But by having the checksum not in the data block, now you read back, presumably from the place you thought you wrote it, and you do the checksum, and it doesn't match. Or you read in the block that was accidentally overwritten, but again, the checksum tells you it's not right. And so it, that's a very key benefit uh, that many people sort of miss, because uh, historically the checksums were being stored in many file systems in the, in the data blocks themselves. So that, that's another key step to keep track of. All right, uh, you can have selective data compression, uh, selective deduplication. Uh, deduplication in particular, because you've got to keep track of essentially a, a table of the, the fingerprints of all the blocks that you're trying to deduplicate, they kind of need to fit in memory. Because as soon as it doesn't fit in memory, it starts to get really slow for checking for duplicate blocks. And as a consequence, uh, ZFS does not require that you do it all or nothing. It's not like, well, I've got to deduplicate everything or none, nothing. You can be selective about where the deduplication happens. And so you just deduplicate you know, file systems that have VMN images or something where there's a lot of blocks to deduplicate because you've got 18 copies of the Windows uh, image in there. And almost every block you know, is a duplicate of one of the other images. Uh, similarly with compression, uh, you may have some things where it's data that's not accessed a lot, so you, you would rather just have it be compressed, and there's other things where it's stuff that you're using all the time, and so you don't want to have the cost of uh, decompressing all the time. So again, you get the, to selectively decide whether or not that's going to be done, and which algorithm you use, and so on. One of the sort of other things which really differentiates uh, ZFS from the traditional UFS is this notion that you have a pool of storage. And so there's just this big block, a uh, pool of blocks, and then they can be doled out to file systems as necessary. So in UFS, you've got to say, all right, this file system has this many blocks, and this one has this other number of blocks. And if you guess wrong, and this one starts to run out, you can't say, well, actually, uh, go borrow some blocks from that one over there. Like, no, no, it doesn't work that way. So. Uh, you can sort of grow them if you happen to be conveniently left some space or something like that. But generally speaking, once you've picked the size, that's what you're stuck with. Uh, now, of course, the problem there is you know, you're in this uh, you know, big happy pool until some, uh, some clown decides to use up all the space. And now every file system runs out of space all at the same time. Uh, so in fact, there is the ability to, first of all, put a limit and say, all right, that file system isn't allowed to have more than certain, this amount of space. Uh, and then, then it's out of space even though there's still space left in the pool. Or conversely, you can reserve space and say, this file system is, you know, it's got our log files on it. It's kind of important. And so we're going to guarantee that it's going to get at least this amount of space. And so, uh, you know, again, the pool will ensure that enough space is saved set aside so that you will always be able to get that amount of space into that particular file system. Um, we also, in ZFS, you sort of think differently about file systems. In UFS, you know, a file system is like, oh, well, gee, you know, do I want var and user to be in two separate file systems, or should they be together, and all this kind of stuff. In ZFS, it's, you know, creating a file system is about as complex as creating a snapshot. It's like, oh, you need another file system? Sure. So you can just give, like, every user's home directory can be a file system if you want. And uh, it, you know, that's just, it's not a problem. You know, special orders don't upset us. Uh, and so uh, you, can, you can have hundreds of file systems uh, within a pool. And then, of course, that allows people to take uh, snapshots for the granularity of file systems. So if everybody's home directory is a, is a file system, then everybody can take a snapshot of their home directory. OK. Uh, there is uh, RAID. Uh, and in, in the parlance of ZFS, it is RAID Z, where Z is sort of you think of as being kind of a variable. So uh, the, the idea is in most RAID systems, you have a fixed number of blocks, or fixed number, yeah, a fixed block size. So if you've got five disks, then you'll typically have like one block off of each disk, and that makes up the RAID block. 
And if you write less than the full size block, then you have to uh, read in the, uh, you know, the parity and recompute it and write it back out again. So the idea of RAID Z is that the ZFS is keeping track of the size of block. So it just the size of a block on the RAID Z is just whatever size it needs to be. So if you're writing out a block that needs sort of three chunks off of disks, then that the size of that particular one is three, and then you need one that's size eight, so it's just eight and so on. And again, I, I'll have a slide that shows how this works. Uh, then with RAID Z, you then get to decide do you want single double or triple parity, which is to say, can you have one, two, or three disks fail uh, before you can't recover? Uh, one of the other big issues with RAID is that you get silent errors. So you have you know, some huge pool, and some sectors go bad, but you haven't read them, so you don't know that they've gone bad. And then when you go to reconstruct, suddenly you can't reconstruct because there's these bad sectors you didn't know about. Uh, so one of the other things that that ZFS has is this notion of scrubbing. And that's where it goes through and just makes sure that all of the blocks that are in use are actually readable. And so that you, know, you can find out sort of before you need uh, to recover a disk that, in fact, uh, there's a problem there. OK. <laughs> uh, apparently. <laughs> It's one way to get out of giving a talk. <laughs> we'll run the talks like, come on out. Everybody out. Everybody out.